I am Elliot Miles McKinley, composer, teacher, and improviser. The topic is post-tonal tonality. Some definitions, because I think it might be confusing to some people, it might be obvious to others, what these terms are. Post-tonal, uh, this funny term, uh, tends to be used when we talk about any kind of music that comes after, in Western music that is, that comes after the common practice period of tonality. In other words, uh, um, 18th and 19th century common tonal practice. So that can include, obviously, atonal music or non-tonal music, um, Schoenberg, Berg, Second Viennese School, that sort of stuff. Um, it can also include Stravinsky uh, or Shostakovich. So then there's tonality, right? Um, and then there's the theory versus practice that I'll, I'll address. So let's talk a little bit about tonal music theory uh, very quickly. This is one of my charts from when I teach music theory to undergrads about diatonic tonal function and expectation. And generally speaking, in tonal music, we have these three regions of tonic, subdominant, what's also sometimes called predominant and dominant, and they tend to move in a counterclockwise fashion if you imagine the circle of fifths. So if you map the circle of fifths, generally speaking, chord progressions in tonal music move counterclockwise um, in terms of the flow. So that's why I have the arrows moving in that direction. These relationships in tonal music are largely framed in fifths. These are, these are polarities of fifths, is the way I like to think about it. So we have tonic, we have the dominant, and then we have the lower dominant, which is the subdominant, right? They're all fifth relationships. So we've got C there in the middle, and we've got F below and G above. And we can do this essentially throughout the diatonic collection. Uh, major, minor, doesn't really matter, actually. We can go through the di diatonic collection and, and map out these kinds of relationships of these fifth polarities. And they all have meaning, they all have function, they all carry different weights in the system, which tends to be hierarchical. If we continue to non-diatonic function and expectation, um, well, what does that mean, right? Where do we get these relationships of tonic, subdominant, dominant in music that doesn't necessarily carry the same kind of direct function? I tend to also think of uh, chord and chord progressions in post-tonal music as having a, a kind of gravity. I'm going to put my, my old teacher and friend, there's George Russell, who would use the term gravity in his Lydian chromatic concept. All right, the first thing to consider is the relative dissonantal tension of vertical and horizontal dimensions. Well, what that really means is chords and melody and counterpoint. And it's all context driven, right? So the context of what you're of the music will yield these relative dynamic not loudness, but dynamic tension maps, if you will. And that can be analogous to the flow of tonic dominant and so forth. The next thing is voice leading and common tone relationships. And these are kind of important uh, because in much of music, tonal or, or non-tonal music, we can often hear uh, a logic of line. And it's not necessarily a melody or a counterpoint per se, but it's kind of a logic of voice leading line from chord to chord or harmony to harmony or, or shifts of modal color. Those, those things can be heard even if they're actually not present in the texture of the music at the moment. Um, it's, it's, it's something that sits kind of under the surface of, of what's going on. And that kind of logic ties into this dissonal tension, this the tension and relaxation of intervals and overtones. And the third thing here uh, is the root motion. So if we're dealing with chords, and, and even chords that aren't necessarily based in thirds, but you know, our ears are going to hear 
naturally the the fundamental as being a root most of the time. And it depends on the structure of, of, of the verticality in terms of intervals, but we're going to hear that fundamental. And that fundamental will often try to scream, hey, I'm important, right? That lowest note, if you will. That coupled with voice leading and coupled with tension and relaxation in terms of uh, the um, relative dissonance, right? I'm not talking about specific dissonances because, you know, a major seventh can be a soft dissonance in some context or a very harsh dissonance in other contexts. Examples that I'm going to use for today, first two examples actually, are going to be a couple of jazz charts. I didn't really do any heavy analysis of these two tunes. I just wanted to throw these two tunes up here as examples for us to set the table for the thing that I did do an analysis of, which is a through composed symphony. I don't pretend to be an, a, an expert. I'm not a music theorist. I'm just a composer. Uh, so I'm happy to also hear questions and get other viewpoints, uh, other perspectives, maybe other ways of hearing these things that, uh, that, that could be also very informative. Let's go on to our first example. Um, I'm in the way. Uh, I'm going to get myself kind of out of the way here. Um, the tune is called Sunday Sun. And I, all of these examples come from, from my father's collection of music. Um, and I have a slide later as to kind of why I use my pop's music as an example. Um, it's really for practical reasons because I have access to all of the stuff and I don't have to worry about copyrights. And it's also really good. So, so all of these things work together. The question here is, um, what key are we in? Well, again, we might not be in a specific key, but there's clearly a sense of tonal grounding in this tune. So then the question is, uh, what key are we in? If that's even an important question to ask, and there's a number of potential ways that we could think about this. If we use tonal analogs, uh, one could say that we might be in D minor, for example. We have F major seven, uh, which can be thought of as the, the augmented mediant of D minor. And in fact, that's, that does serve as a dominant, that has a dominant function in tonal music. And so that's not unusual uh, to think of perhaps D minor as being our key. But then we don't stay there, right? We, we move around. In fact, this E flat major, you know, this B flat to E flat, it's like a five to one in E flat, right? So we're modulating, but we're not really staying in any really one place for very long. And it's not really setting up a series of, of traditional two, five, one cadential progressions either. This is something of a facetious question, but it's a question that people, many people may, may attempt to ask um, is, you know, what it's it clearly this music has tonal grounding, but it is not necessarily tonal from the major minor tonal system in terms of grounding, okay? This is a similar example. Uh, this is a tune called Three Flowers. And I'll just play uh, the opening and the first time through the head.
you could think of this as being maybe an F minor, right? It makes sense. There's there's a big traditional, if you will, dominant pedal point opening, and then a nice big altered dominant at the end that sort of slams you into F minor, and then suddenly, whoa, maybe we're an E minor, right? Maybe we're an E minor Dorian. Uh, and then it kind of seems like he's favoring E minor Dorian in the tune, right? With these parallel shifts. And then we kind of go in somewhere other place and, and it's, and there's tonal ambiguity for a while. And then there's this traditional sequential cycle of basically two, five. It's like, it's maybe pointing to a minor, but then this points to F minor. Right, this is two five, altered two five in, in A minor, and then this is two five in F minor. And then we do go to F, right? We could look at a lot of different tunes, not just my Pops tunes, but like a lot of Wayne Shorter tunes or Herbie Hancock tunes that I would study when I was uh, learning, do a lot of the similar kinds of things. They have They have these little flavors of tonal analogs that happen and then these departures, but they're never really straying too, too, too far away from being tonally, tonally grounded, fundamentally grounded, tonally grounded. So, symphony number three. My pop was commissioned by the Kusevitsky Foundation in 1983 to compose a new orchestral work, and he decided to compose this for Gerard Schwartz in the New York Chamber Symphony. There is an overall tonal center, and you'll see as we go through the piece why I might argue that it's B-flat minor. Is it? Is it? Well, it may not be definitively so, but it seems that the piece is organized around B-flat minor. There is a chord, a home chord, home sonority, uh, that my father even, in his program notes, outlines um, and that that's in a f slide that's coming up and that chord keeps coming back he generally has the preference for minor sonorities with a major seventh and when he's using upper level extensions so in in terms of tertian harmony ninths elevenths and thirteenths the eleventh is usually sharped the same thing if he has a major chord sonority he often will raise the fifth it's often an augmented major seventh chord and again if there are upper uh, structure tones present, the sharp 11 is usually present. There's also a, a, a fairly good mixture of root progression that will follow some tonal analogs, but also work by common tone mediant. And we didn't really talk about that in the jazz tune, tunes, but in the jazz tunes, there were a lot of mediant relationships. And what I mean by that is that the roots are moving by thirds. And there are a lot of common tones that hold over. And, and in that case, you end up getting modal shifts more than anything else. He does have a number of chords and sonorities that are purely voice leading. But like I said in an earlier slide, that voice leading it has an internal logic that's leading somewhere. And I'll put myself back in just so I feel like I'm talking to you. Uh, one can think of voice leading chords um, along the same lines as sequencing chords. When you sequence, you're kind of getting on a bus and sort of moving through a sequence. And that's a form of voice leading where the chords themselves may not matter a whole lot, but the overall, the overall landing spot may matter more. Let's go on. The first movement is a rondo. And my, my father even actually says that in his program notes. He calls it a rondo. At first, I kind of thought maybe it wasn't a rondo, but, but after examining it, it is in fact a rondo, a multi-part rondo. The second movement is a long lyrical line that is a strophic cycle. Um, the strophic cycle comes back four times. Starts out with a horn solo, then it rotates itself through the orchestra twice, and then it comes back at the end as in a violin solo. And it's harmonically varied. There's, there are a set of harmonic variations present. Uh, so the melody doesn't get varied but the harmonies get varied. The melody gets varied in terms of rhythm. It doesn't get played exactly the same, uh, but the notes don't change. And then the third movement, uh, which I'm in the way, uh, the third movement is a waltz, and it's a rounded binary. Here's the home 
sound chord, the home sonority of, of, of the piece. The chord is this. Okay. Now, some people might look at this chord and think of it as a C minor 13 chord uh, because it's an Aeolian. It's, it's all seven notes of C Aeolian mode, C natural minor, being voiced in thirds, basically, if you were to stack them as thirds. I like to think of this chord more like a double polychord, as a B dominant seventh on top of a C minor seventh, with B flat as being your, your axis. And this also tends to lend a bit more strength to the argument that perhaps this piece is in fact in B flat. I don't think it's really a 13th chord because in jazz parlance, when we talk about minor chords, almost always in jazz, we're going to use the um, Dorian version of this. So there would be an A natural. So that's why I tend not to call it a C minor 13, because if I put C minor 13, it would, it would be played with an A natural, not an A flat. But you may disagree with me on, on that interpretation. Uh, but that's how I'm choosing to do it. Here is the home chord uh, appearing in the second movement. This home chord occurs multiple times in all the movements. And one thing that uh, I failed to point out is that every time that this chord occurs, it is registrally invariant, which means it's always in the same register. It's never revoiced in different ways. It's in the same register. Occasionally, there's an additional doubling on the top by a flute or something of this nature, but it's almost always going to appear in the position that it's appearing here, <laughs> uh, which is this. Okay. Which gives that chord a lot more aural recall. If you keep something as being registrally invariant, then when you hear it and you keep hearing it in the same register, your ear will recognize it and gravitate towards it more as something, oh, hey, I've heard that before. So it occurs in, in a series of other locations in the piece. It occurs in the second movement the most, and it is the central harmonic structure of the second movement. Weirdly enough, I wouldn't call the second movement as being in C. I'd actually call the second movement as being in F minor, not in C. So if we just take a moment to listen to these chords in different contexts. So that's after the opening in measure 34. And again, that's just some doubling with harp and um, uh, tubular bells. And then in measure 57, so a very quick arrival and then a continuation, measure 71. And then again in measure 100. Again, registrally invariant. You're always hearing it in the same way. You're also hearing it scored. It's always scored in the strings in very similar ways. And then finally in the third movement, there are a couple instances. and then the end of the piece. What's interesting about that is that that's, uh, he adds an F sharp or G flat, actually it's spelled as a G flat above, um, that chord in the two times it appears in the third movement. An analysis like this does not attempt necessarily to capture all the details, uh, nor 
is this attempting to be a definitive? In other words, it, it probably could be heard a number of different ways. And uh, that's the one nice thing about the discourse of music theory or music analysis is that it often is the domain of the person doing the analysis in terms of how they might be hearing it. Um, so that can be an interesting perspective on how that person hears. In the first movement, there are actually three key areas. And again, I, I'll put the key in quotes, B flat, which is starts off in B flat minor, there's C minor and D flat minor. Not perhaps uncoincidentally, those are also scale degrees one, two, and three of B flat minor. And it also happens to be the opening gesture, the opening motivic gesture, right? And that, that gesture appears many times in the, in the first movement. Was my dad aware of this stuff while he was writing? Probably not. And this is a page, I'll get myself out of the way, and you can see it's written in pencil. He's erased. He's changed his mind a few times. Um, I, I haven't tried to decipher what he erased, but this is pretty much how the rest of the whole piece looks in terms of the manuscript. It was written very quickly, and it was written in a state of, you know, one could call white-hot inspiration. I think he was very aware of playing with that particular sonority, that that C minor 13 or B flat dominant 7 over C minor 7 sonority. That clearly was going to be an ar architectural uh, point for him. That that he even acknowledged in the program note um, sa says a lot about about his thinking about it. Uh, I will do more of these kinds of things. I will do more analysis, more composer pop-up workshops. And great. So, hey, everybody, have a good rest of your, of your afternoon and uh, however, wherever you are. And uh, thanks for tuning in and we'll, we'll talk to you later. Thank you very much.